What's up, peeps? How y'all doing today? Carpo's moment of uh, zen here. This is <laughs> this is my moment of WTF, man. Sit down with the camera and <sighs> how's everybody doing? I know that that's just kind of a stupid thing to say. It's making a video and I'll ask how people are doing often, and it's like you know, hey, what's up, everybody? And of course I'll get a response in the comment section, but you know, as far as uh, it's an interesting thing, being me, talking to the camera, more or less talking to myself, and uh, knowing that people in the future, or rather right now, there is no future or past. I don't know, you know, whenever I start a video I have intentions of talking about a particular subject and then I end up rambling about something like making a video or you know, my mind's always working on some strange idea. But I keep it simple and balanced and even. And I try to float and ebb and flow with the tides properly. Today I wrote down a couple of notes. What were they? I've learned to do this. Uh, this is something I used to do for my videos for the first couple of years. I would take notes during the day when I had an idea in my like notebook, literally notebook. I just would take notes, have ideas, and I have like these, you know, spiral notebooks just full of ideas and like journals, which are nothing more than a conglomeration of just crazy shit and uh, <laughs> you know weird writings and rants. Some of it's occult knowledge or talking about you know archetypes and. You know, sometimes it's about ancient pyramid or, you know, just weird thing like that. Things like that. All different stuff. And by doing that, it allows me to remember, oh, I had this important point I wanted to share. And and in the past, I would write these ideas down and they get lost. And this is why I started making videos. It's kind of like a way to share that. And uh, I have a very, just a couple of notes today. It was just, uh, yeah, three things. I guess I'll start with the first one, which I'm not going to talk about a whole lot. If something is controversial, that means the issue doesn't have a definite answer. If something is controversial, it means that something has a controversy about it, meaning that sides can't agree about what is right or wrong. Now, let me give you an example here. When you're talking about the sky being blue, there are people out there who may believe it's a different color. Let's, let's get to something different. Let's, say the, the, let's go to the, the um, moon hologram conspiracy people who believe that the moon is a projection. Now if enough people believed that, it would be the moon hologram controversy. But since very few people believe it, the term tends to be con uh, a conspiracy rather than controversy. Of course conspiracy meaning that a group of people, uh, more than a couple people are involved in you know hiding something. Uh, but a controversy could be a conspiracy as well, but my point being is that a lot of these th things are called conspiracies because they're small enough to not be a controversy. Most people aren't going to argue that the moon is real. There are people who choose to, you know, perpetuate the myth that, you know, I probably shouldn't have used that example because I'm sure there's somebody out there watching who, who's like, oh, you're so wrong, the moon is a hologram. I really didn't want to even go into that. My whole thing is to talk about what is a controversy, because a lot of times when there's a controversy with something, people always tend to pick sides and think that they're right. Um, and a controversy means just that, that there is no solid answer, and so that's why we're discussing things. And this comes down to like rhetoric and the Aristotelian idea of an argument. Let's say we have the ethos, pathos, and logos, the three sides of an argument, or um, I should say, what is it? The, the three components of rhetoric, you know, um, I believe that's ethos, pathos, and logos. You've got the, uh, the speaker, you know, the subject, and how it's conveyed are all important factors. And when something's controversial, it's really important to be able to speak on the issue without being a dick. All right, that's all I wanted to say, I guess, on that. Just to, you know, when when we find somebody disagrees with us, especially on the internet, it's really easy to just cast a stone and say, oh dude, you're wrong. And I do it too. And I know this. I'm guilty as the next party. I'm not here pointing the finger. I'm saying we all do it together. We're all part of the same team. We're all the same person. We all are one. And, and we need to start acting like it. 
So I figure I can put my best foot forward and at least try to say, hey, you know, my hand is extended to anyone who wants to have a, uh, a honest discussion about something without pushing views on another person, as long as the person's not telling me what I should be thinking. Because I've had discussions with folks where they say, hey, you just got to be open-minded. And I'll say, okay, I'm open-minded. And I'll listen to what they have to say. And then I'll say, okay, I've listened to what you have to say. And I disagree with you. And then a person will say, you're just closed and you can't listen. Or if I dispute something a person says and they say, well, you're just not open-minded enough to go do the research. But maybe it's something I've already researched intensively and disputed and found it doesn't agree with me. These are all the factors to remember when we're having a discussion or an argument. Getting heated is fine, that's a normal part of an argument, but when it happens it's time to walk away for a minute, because when you're angry you lose almost all your reasoning faculties. Your body goes into fight or flight mode and you can't think clearly, so that's why people walk away from something for a while. So I guess I wanted to mention that because there's a lot of controversies out there and people uh, disagree intensively on things. And that's just fine, but if it is a controversy, that means there's no solid answer to it. Um, <laughs> the things we've learned in life. <laughs> Slowly, wisdom is growth, meaning of life. There it is. That's that. That's uh, the note meant that you know. Once people say, "What is the meaning of life?" My answer to that is growth. Growth meaning moving forward and knowing in your heart that you're doing better than you were previously and that you're not stagnating. I can't even expound on that or go any further because I believe that each each man and woman has an inherent knowledge about themselves and knows when they're failing and they know when they're doing well and they know it has nothing to do with money or education although it has a little to do with education only in the sense that the more wisdom we gain and what I, this is why I said that the, you know, what did I say? Yeah. The things we've learned, wisdom is growth. If you say that wisdom is growth, a lot of people who don't have wisdom or never really learned a whole lot, or maybe they don't, even, maybe they're not even able to read or write, uh, they may say, "Hey, that's not fair because I feel like I'm growing, but I don't really have a lot of wisdom." Wisdom isn't reading and writing. Wisdom is experience. So, wisdom is knowing I've done this before or I've seen this before, and it either works or it doesn't. Wisdom is growth because the more things we learn about life, and knowledge is growth too, because the more things we know about our world, the better decisions we can make to make sure that we don't mess up again and again. And this is why knowledge of history is so important. And I may have not given a damn about Mesopotamia when I was in school, although I do remember hearing about the, you know, the, the Hittites and the you know, all these different groups and you start remembering these geographic locations and, you know, but they, none of it served me until I left high school and asked myself, why do I want to know history? Nobody taught me why to learn history. Nobody taught me why I should want to know history. They would just say the old bullshit, you're doomed to repeat it. You know, if you don't know the past, you're doomed to repeat it. I say, but, you know, we're not going to ride around on horses like Napoleon or, you know, we're not going to, uh, you know, what kind of past are we going to learn from by learning about the Mesopotamians or, the, you know, Native Americans? Well, we know now, as you get older, why history is important. History is a part of wisdom, and it's something that our ancient cultures didn't have. So I know people look back and they revere these ancient cultures and say, wow, they were wise. Perhaps they had tapped into the ether. Maybe they were more in tune with their environment. Maybe they vibrated on a different level, frequency, where they had more intuition. But they did not have the sure, uh, the sure assuredness about certain things that we do today. Now we have a lot of things we're not as sure about, but there are a lot of things we are sure about through science. And I'm not using science as say, oh, the science to me means nothing. It's just another path for discovery. Science has limits. Science can never prove certain things about existence. They can only be felt. This is just my my own belief. <clears throat> The science has limits, just like spirituality has limits to explain our, our, our world. In other words, science is tr trying to explain a non-material world in material sense, while religion is trying to explain a material world in a non-material sense. We need both. They're intertwined. This is something that should be obvious to people. 
that science was never brought about to dispute religion. Science was brought about to help to confer and conclude ideas about religion to understand them better. Just because the sun is in the center and not the earth doesn't mean that everything is false. And let me say this off the top because I, I don't say this very often, you know, it's, but I think we, you know, people in the past have mistakenly thought, oh, that I hate religion or have something against religion. My belief is that we need more religion. And I'm going to repeat that. We need more religion. And I say that in a way that means religion in its original sense, meaning sticking to morals, values, and principles, and believing that there's something greater than you, that there's something greater than all of us, even if that's something as simple as the whole of all of us. In other words, God can even mean all humans combined as a larger mind than a single individual. If we can break away from the idea that we are independent from one another, because we're not. Anyone who's tried to <clears throat> make life understandable in terms of separation realizes after years of trial and error that there is no separation. The line is only drawn with our minds. And people can argue and say, hey, that's bullshit, you know, you can't prove any of it, and none of that matters to a person who gets themselves and understands what I'm talking about. It's not something that's pious or you'd have to prove to anyone. It's just a, a quiet, collected comfort that comes with having your internal director or your coordinator, your mental coordinator, as Manly Hall calls it, uh, properly using the faculties of knowledge and wisdom and adhering to principles and values that we know are correct so we can move forward as an individual, which helps the whole. So my belief is that we need more religion, we need less dogma, we need less group effort towards finding God, and we need more individual search for the truth within. And, uh, you know, I guess the only way to really get that, uh, from, in my opinion, is that what, what I, I also heard Manly Hall say it was the, uh, he called it the moderation of intensities. And I really love that description. It's something I've worked on for many years and something that I'm going to continue to work on for the rest of my life. Moderating intensities means that there are no extremes. If you find yourself unhappy in life, it means that you are going against truth in some part of your life. And it's a statement that I've heard people say, but it's really hard for me to say that because it's almost like, I know a lot of people are unhappy and think, hey, I'm living in the best truth I know, you know, I'm doing the best I can, but there really is a line of thought that says that if you are not happy, then you're not doing the best you can. And this excludes people who have obviously uh, you know, serious physical ailments that maybe just came about, you know, there are times when we suffer. But even those who are missing arms and legs find a way to be happy. Uh, there, everything is internal. If we don't play the pity game with ourselves, we can feel sorry for others, and we can ask for others to feel sorry for us, but ultimately, the moderation of intensities is what's key. And that means that if you're getting angry about something, then there's a serious issue to work on with that. I mean, anger comes from unresolved problems within your own psyche. Now, if we get into, uh, people talking, might talk about brain chemistry or chemical imbalances that cause a person to be unhappy or depressed. Now, this is true, but my belief is that a majority of the time that brain imbalance, that chemistry imbalance is caused by improper living or living not within what your instinct tells you to live, um, the way your intuition knows. In other words, you know, although, you know, people may think, well, physical and mental pain are different things, they're really dealt with the same with the brain. They deal with the same neural pathways. So if you're having emotional pain in your life, it can manifest as physical symptoms, okay? Just like when you have physical pain, it can create emotional havoc. These are intertwined. This is a fact, you know, these aren't things, this is, these are things that science is finally catching up to. That one day it's going to say, okay, well, there is more to intention. I saw an interview with the guy from the 80s, some doctor or 70s, and he said uh, he said that there are a lot of people out there saying that you can 
heal yourself intentionally. And he said, what a preposterous notion. You know, there's nothing more ludicrous than that idea that you could affect your health by thinking about it. And right about the same time, there was another guy in a totally different situation saying, you know, uh, that there's people that are saying that plants communicate with one another. And he said, that's just preposterous, that's ludicrous. There were a bunch of scientists laughing at people saying, there's no way that plants can communicate with one another. They just can't. They don't have brains. Well, as it turned out, the plants do communicate with one another. And, you know, as it turns out, we do control our health to a degree. We do manifest illnesses as well as take them away. And much of it is through mental action. Now, I hear people say this, and I've been hearing people say this over the years. So when I say it, I almost feel like, a, like I'm like dwelling in their charlatan bullshit. And when I say that, I mean because a lot, there are a lot of guys out there who are trying to sell you courses on healing your chakras, and, and, and I don't even want to get into it, you know? So many people have bought into this crap. And in fact, I have several emails that I've received from this company, and I did a video over this a while back where it's uh, like Meg Benedict and, and and all these other supposed psychic guys. And I was really disappointed because I found like guys like, you know, Bruce Lipton and a bunch of these other like speakers that were talking about these world issues that have all kind of uh, coalesced into this big ball of conspiracy nuts that basically say that, you know, you know, this is the the future of the, the race and we're gonna the breakaway race they call it, that they we're gonna get away from the aliens that are running the world and yada yada and the banking system and they hold these online webinars that are like four hundred dollars and you know, oh yeah, pay now and you get a discount. I I'm signed up for these emails somehow so I keep getting them, but the reason I brought that up is because it these are people who are taking advantage of people's discomfort about who they are. Uh, and on one hand, you want to blame the person who's dumb enough to spend thousands of dollars on somebody telling them who they are. But this is nothing new. This has been going on since people have wanted to control one another. People want to believe... And, and, and this isn't just the fault of the people who want to take control. There are people who want to take control of others and control their lives. But there are also people who want to be controlled. And this is what I've realized over the last couple decades that there are sheeple, and there are people, and there are everyone in between, and wolves and shepherds and everything else, but but those who, a lot of those who are controlled want to be controlled. I've realized that many people who believe in a larger conspiracy, let's say that they believe that every nook and cranny of society is totally controlled and everything that happens is a system of play. Oh, that's such a novel way to think. It's, a, it's beyond conspiracy thinking, it's into religious thinking. It's believing that we're watched by Big Brother, which is just like God, that they're keeping an eye on what we're doing, just like God, that uh, they decide who lives and who dies and who survives, just like God. And then I hear the same story proposed with aliens, that the aliens have been watching over us, and that the aliens have created humans through genetic experimentation, just like Adam and Eve, and that the, the aliens are watching over us just like God, and that they decide when we've made mistakes just like God, it becomes the God complex, the big brother complex, the daddy complex, and it all breaks down to father. Everybody wants their father back, you know? Everybody wants somebody in their life that can tell them how to be a man or be a woman or whatever it might be. I guess a man doesn't, father doesn't tell a girl how to be a woman, but he treats his, his, his uh, you know, his daughter, there's a mother, certain mother-daughter, or a father-daughter relationship, just like a father-son relationship, and this is totally separate from mother, which is matter, mother, matter, earth, a different thing, um, but father being the spiritual essence, you know, it's something that took me a long time to understand. Why does father have to be God? Why does God have to be male? And then I realized that male doesn't mean masculine. And then it all makes sense, you know, that male and female are nothing more than just 0110101. It's just binary for the universal mind. And this universal mind is aware. And that we're neurons within this universal mind. And that every cell within our body, to those cells, we are like a universe. And you go on our daily lives going to work, coming home, doing the best we can, trying to ponder about life when we can, 
not wanting to think too hard because, oh boy, we have bills to pay and things to do, but, and then I'll hear uh, folks say, oh, how do you find the time to philosophize or think about things? I think, how do you not find the time? What are the other options? You work eight hours, sleep eight hours, we think for eight hours. There's lots of other things to do, but there's plenty of time and the mind is in your full control. So. Uh, to the moderation of intensities, because I kind of got off subject there. It's all about moderating how intense you are about one thing or another. If you tend to lean extremely towards one side in any direction, then there's something wrong. Now, there's an exception to that, and those are basic values and integrities. If a person always leans towards honesty, that doesn't mean that they're an extremist towards honesty. But that person also has to realize that there is a degree when dishonesty fits in. And this is looking at evil through rose-colored glasses, if you will. To realize that there is nothing construct but constructs of what's evil, what's good and bad. The very reason why ancient man put God as a figure, an old man with a white beard, it wasn't because they really believed that God had a white beard. That never, there was never, never a culture in history that really believed that God was a man with a white beard. These are just, uh, unfortunately today, there probably are a lot of them, and through history there were probably uh, the less aware within the churches and the believing systems who really believed that. But those in the upper, you know, upper realms of the church never believed that. They used that as a symbol for people because it symbolizes that wisdom that comes with aging, with growth, showing our root value, which is wisdom. We symbolize God as a wise old man in Christianity because wisdom is what we cherish. And we push that away because we don't want to admit, if we don't have any, that we need some wisdom. And it's a condition that uh, I've seen a lot of times. People who don't know very much tend to push all knowledge away and stick with a very closed set of beliefs that helps them to not have to look too far beyond what they believe in their paradigms. They've got their political views, they've got their religious views, they know what they need to do, and they work and they're going to retire at 65, and they're going to get their social security, and, uh, you know, these are not dumb people, and these are not idiots, these are not bad people. They're just ignorant. And ignorant is not a bad word. So I should clarify that. Ignorant means you just aren't unaware of all the facts. And the one important fact is, are you happy? And if you're not, then there's something in your life you're living that's not within truth. You're not living to your truest potential. And I know this for a fact because in my life, the times when I haven't been happy, I'm not living up to my full potential. I'm either not working hard enough, I'm not thinking hard enough, I'm not doing things I should be doing. There are still things that I'm irresponsible about, many of them, lots of things I need to take care of in my life, but I don't put myself down over it. I say, all right, I feel a way about this. I feel a way that says that I should take care of this next time. And hopefully by the time I'm into my 50s, 60s maybe, I'll have these things figured out and laugh at them. But I'll never look back and say, I should have, could have, or would have, because that does no good for anybody. So that's Carpo's evening rant, and uh, I'm going to cut it short because I have something else to talk about, and if I go on too long, I won't have any energy left for the next video.